Hi, this is a lecture on model extraction attacks. So in the grand scheme of our trustworthy uh, AI uh, roadmap, uh, we're still in the security goal, but um, as we have discussed for other kinds of attacks like uh, adversarial examples, um, data poisoning attacks and membership inference attacks, the security implications of um, models being stolen may also uh, reflect as uh, safety issues in in the in the broader area of you know security uh, versus safety. So our focus specifically is going to be when we have a model that we have deployed as let's say a prediction API, and then uh, this model is somehow stolen or approximated by an adversary who is interested in, let's say, the intellectual property of the model or some sensitive data that the model was uh, trained on, okay? So that's our goal uh, in the grand scheme of our trustworthy AI umbrella here. Uh, so um, in particular, we're gonna talk about first define uh, what uh, model extraction is and why it matters. Uh, and then we'll talk about the threat model considerations because this is uh, also one of the attacks against machine learning models. Uh, next, uh, we're gonna discuss a little more about the specific techniques behind how this model extraction attacks are going to be mounted. Uh, and interestingly, model extraction attacks are have connections with other attacks, uh, the kind of attacks that we talked about, specifically adversarial examples, and uh, training po data poisoning attacks, uh, specifically uh, in, in the sense of uh, um, not training poisoning, rather uh, membership inference attacks, especially when um, models are trained on uh, privacy sensitive data that uh, amounts to, for example, stealing the whole model is good enough for uh, learning new things about the data. And, uh, We'll talk about uh, some defense ideas uh, among the, the attacks that we've covered so far. Um, in my opinion, the most difficult attack to defend against is membership inference. Uh, and you will see why this is uh, tough. Okay, so that's gonna be our, our goal for the lecture. So let's jump into the first part, which is model extraction. What is it and why does it matter? Okay, so again, uh, in the sense of our, uh, supervised machine learning uh, pipeline that we are considering throughout the lectures. Uh, so we have a model that is uh, trained on some training data D uh, and we deploy this model as a, a black box model through a prediction API. So I'm gonna use the notation FB to mean F, uh, the model that the black box model. Uh, and we have a user who is querying the model on some set of inputs, let's say it gives X1 and gets Y1 back and so on for some number of samples that the, the user has access to, to query this uh, prediction API. And the machine learning as a service paradigm uh, is a very attractive business model for providers of machine learning uh, as a service. So all these companies are examples of the big names that are out there who adopted this machine learning as a service. So, you know, um, something as a service has become a, a paradigm of its own in terms of providing like platforms, software, infrastructure, and other things. Even cybercrime as a service is a business model, uh, not in the mainstream economy, but in the underground economy of cyber criminals. So something as a service uh, is a fashion and machine learning is not an exception. Okay, so the way we, uh, the framing of model extraction attacks is in the sense of this machine learning as a service paradigm. Okay, so what is the motivation? As I said, uh, you can monetize this process as we do it, you know, pay per use for other services like software, platform, infrastructure, and so on. Uh, here, it could be pay per query. And from the deployer's point of view or the machine learning as a service provider's point of view, we want to make sure that this is um, well, the, the, the API is, uh, is available all the time and the predictions are precise. Otherwise, customers will go away. And while we maintain the availability and the, the availability of the service and the precision of the, the predictions, 
We also want to make sure that we are not exposing or uh, endangering the confidentiality of the data that is behind the model and the model itself uh, in terms of the architecture of the model, the parameters of the model and other details of the model that might uh, leak uh, very important uh, information about the model. And doing this is very expensive, especially if you look at it from the perspective of companies like this ones, where they would spend a, a lot of money in terms of compute power and human resources to expose a prediction as a service or machine learning as a service. Um, case in point is, for instance, uh, OpenAI's chat GPT or similar models, uh, large language models, which uh, obviously require a lot to train. So the data collection, uh, the compute power, and uh, the time spent by people to bring the service up uh, uh, and running uh, is, uh, is significant. For example, there are some rough estimates as to um, how much was spent on compute power on GPT-3 by just do, doing a ballpark estimate uh, based on, for example, what is the typical rate of um, using cloud services these days, like on Microsoft Azure or, or Google Clouds, et cetera. So there was an estimate that pointed to, for example, GPT-3, which is the precursor of the current version of GPT, uh, to, to uh, you know incur about, let's say, roughly $4.6 million. So as you can see, the price tag is also uh, significant. So there is, there is motivation. So the question now is, uh, given all this, uh, given the, the monetization and the fact that this is expensive and the, what sits behind the prediction API could be a, a model trained on sensitive data or intellectual property, what can an adversary do to avoid this cost? So there would be a motivation for stealing machine learning models, right? So that is where the model extraction tag uh, comes. Okay, so again, on the same setup that I introduced earlier, uh, now change this user to an adversary, okay? So it's someone who is interested to steal the model or somehow get a copy of this model. So how does this happen? So the assumption here is that the uh, adversary would have some data set D prime, okay? And this D prime is oftentimes much smaller than uh, the training set D. And it is usually, um, it's usually, um, it doesn't intersect with uh, D, okay? Um, even if it intersects a little bit with D, it's not a big issue, but for the sake of, you know, the, the discussion here, you can safely assume that this may not intersect at all. And there is oftentimes some query limit as to how many queries the adversary can send to the prediction API. Uh, so let's suppose that there isn't like uh, the query limit is not you know infinite, right? Okay, so as we said earlier, the uh, adversary, just like any other user, would send out uh, inputs and get predictions back. And they can do this for as many queries as they are allowed. For example, if M is the limit of the query, they can do it M times. Okay, so now uh, the, the idea is for the model trainer, the, for the adversarial client here to use this data that has, has been labeled uh, by querying the model uh, and train what we call a substitute model or FS. Uh, is what I'm going to use throughout the lecture to denote the substitute model. That is more or less uh, the same as uh, the target model that was uh, deployed behind the prediction API. So the idea is to use the target model as an oracle to locally train what we call the substitute model. And the requirement of this substitute model is that the substitute model is uh, is approximate approximately the same as the target models uh, in terms of their functionality or uh, the decision boundary. So in other words, what we're saying is without access to the original data set D, uh, but with some uh, other data set D prime that comes from uh, the same distribution as D and is disjoint with D, we want to obtain uh, uh, the substitute model that is functionally equivalent to the target model. Okay, so for, what we're aiming for is this functional equivalence. and. I'll expand on what that exactly means. And the other names for model extraction attack are, uh, you, you could see this as model stealing or model approximation. 
But technically speaking, what we're doing is actually model approximation for the most part. Okay, so that is what model extraction is at a high level and the key idea behind it. Um, I didn't tell you how this could be done, but um, that is, that's what we're gonna talk about uh, uh, in a bit. But before we get there, um, why, why should someone be interested in um, extracting or stealing models? Okay, so I have kind of alluded to this notion of, okay, there is intellectual property that goes behind these models that are trained and deployed as prediction APIs. Uh, so um, you wanna steal that intellectual property. So one of the natural reasons is uh, theft of intellectual property or some proprietary data that the model was trained on. And this, maybe you, you are a competitor to uh, the deployer of the machine learning as a service provider there, and you wanna steal that model and get the competitive advantage, or you wanna maximize your revenue, or uh, you wanna impose some reputation damage against your competitors, right? So this is fair game, and this is a, a good enough uh, reason for um, model extraction. The other is if the model was trained on sensitive data, like for example, medical data or financial data, then uh, by extracting the model, you are basically getting a copy of the distilled version of the data set. And you, can, uh, you could run all kinds of attacks on that one, like membership imprints and so on. Uh, and you could see uh, the possibility of confidentiality breach, uh, which might end up with legal or regulatory uh, consequences. Another important reason why we should care about membership inference is, mem uh, sorry, model extraction, is model extraction could be used as a stepping stone for attacks uh, that uh, could be even more dangerous. For instance, adversarial example attacks or uh, privacy motivated attacks. So in that sense, uh, it will widen this the attack surface uh, where uh, this could be used for mounting other powerful attacks. Okay, uh, so there might be other reasons, but these are sort of the well understood reasons as to why model extraction should be taken seriously. Okay, so like any other attack, we have to talk a little bit about uh, threat model considerations for uh, model extraction attacks. So when you look at the machine learning or service provider, uh, the threat model considerations are the following. So the goal of the machine learning or the service provider could serve is to serve accurate predictions okay uh, on inputs while also making sure that the model details are confidential uh, and the data set is also confidential so the model and the data need to be protected and to ensure this the machine learning as a service provider could um, do some preventive or countermeasures or defensive countermeasures for example they could set a query limit per user, per IP address, and so on. Uh, they could add noise to the predictions while uh, making sure that the predictions uh, maintain the quality or the precision that is expected of the service because quality of service matters here uh, since you're charging users to, uh, to pay for each query. Uh, and when you look at the threat model from the other side of the aisle in, in terms of the adversaries, uh, the adversary's capability and knowledge, here are some considerations about the threat model. Uh, the typical use case is a black box access to target a model uh, trained on some data set, and the adversary can query and receive predictions, and this prediction could be just the label of the input, or it could be some um, fine-grained information like the confidence scores of each uh, label or each class. Um, the Typically, we assume that the adversary has no access to the details of the model, like the model architecture, the parameters, or training uh, data. Um, you know, nothing more than what is publicly available. Um, and typically, if you deploy something as a prediction API, uh, the reason why you're deploying it that way is because you want to protect the confidentiality of either your intellectual property or some pretty sensitive data. The other capability uh, and knowledge that we assume about an adversary is the adversary can generate uh, or collect a separate data set, uh, D prime, uh, that is much smaller than the original training set. And uh, they would use uh, the elements of data points in D prime to uh, query uh, the target model. 
Uh, so the target model in this case is serving as a querying uh, oracle. And the other capability that we assume about the adversary is they are able to locally train a subsystem model on this uh, data set D prime, uh, and they would uh, be able to compare uh, the effectiveness of uh, the extraction by comparing the results of prediction results of the subsystem model and the target model on a separate data set D double prime. And this is usually the case for the uh, relation between the original training set of the target model D, the subsequent model's training set D prime, and the evaluation of the comparison data set D double prime. So they, we typically assume that these are disjoint, but even if there is some overlap between these three data sets, uh, the trend model still holds true. Okay, so the other um, angle of the threat model is, uh, so over here I talked about knowledge and capabilities of the adversary, or what we would assume, uh, but the adversarial goals could be uh, classified into the following. So one is accuracy. So the goal of the adversary is to extract a subsistent model that is accurate on uh, the task that at hand. So for example, if it's in my image classification, we want uh, the subsistent model to be a, a good a uh, model that is usable and that has good accuracy. The other is uh, dimension is called a fidelity, which is in this case, the adversary is interested in extracting a substitute model that mimics the functionality of the target model. Even if the target model is making some uh, prediction mistakes on some inputs, we don't try to correct the target model. We rather take the, mo the target model for whatever it is and uh, we, we take it from there. So functional equivalence is what we're aiming for, regardless of how accurate or how good the model is. The third dimension of adversarial goals is the stealth or the undetectability of the uh, model extraction attack. So what we, what we aim for as an adversary in this case is we wanna make sure that this uh, extraction attack or attempt is undetectable when the adversary queries the target model on samples from either the training set of the substitute or the comparison set between the substitute and the target model. So those are some of the highlights of uh, the points around uh, threat model, both from the adversary's point of view and also the machine learning other service provider's point of view. Okay. So now we can talk about attacks. So we've uh, we've defined what model extraction attacks are, why we should care about them, and uh, threat model considerations. Now we can talk about attacks. Okay, so um, here's how we're gonna start. So model extraction problem statement, right? So we'll, we'll first pose the model extraction problem in general, and then we'll see if this is a solvable problem in polynomial time or not. And if not, we have to find uh, some way of simplifying this uh, problem. Okay, so what we have is, I'm gonna use the same notations like FB, FS, and so on throughout D, D prime, et cetera. So uh, in that sense, uh, it should be clear at this point. So we're given a black box access to this uh, target model FB, which was trained on, let's say, images, for example, as an image classifier. And the goal is to extract a subset model FS that solves the same task reasonably well. So if the image classifier, the original target model was classifying uh, images at 99.5% accuracy with a very minimal uh, mistakes, then we want the, the substitute model that we extract or we are still uh, to be um, performing the same. Okay, so to solve this problem, uh, you can approach it in two, in two ways. Uh, one is this idealistic way of extracting uh, the model exactly, so exact model extraction, uh, where you your aim is you want to extract uh, the substitute model, which is exactly the same as or the exact copy of the target model. The other alternative is to extract a model, a substitute model that is functionally equivalent to the target model. So you may not uh, it may not be it may not be possible at all to come up with an exact copy, so you might resort to uh, functional equivalent extraction. So, as you might suspect, the first option, the idealistic option, is intractable. So it's basically an NP-hard problem, 
Uh, and uh, you don't want to go there because um, you may not solve this in polynomial time. Uh, the second case is still intractable because again, here the search space is pretty wide and potentially infinite, but you can do some empirical approximation of uh, the functional equivalence. Uh, and that is where we're going to spend most of the time uh, in this lecture. And, um, you know, um, Frankly speaking, this is uh, also the approach that is used by many uh, model extraction attacks that are out there since the first attack was uh, introduced back in 2016. Okay, so um, functional equivalence, which forces us to kind of reframe our model extraction problem uh, as follows. So everything else is the same, except that our goal now is modified to extract what we call a functional equivalent model uh, that basically uh, um, mimics the functionality of the target model. And we wanna extract this functional equivalence model uh, with some confidence. And our updated problem statement is gonna be like this. So we want to extract uh, FS that is almost the same as FB or the target model, uh, such that the distance between the two models is bounded by some limit epsilon, okay? So we want this this distance to be small, as small as it can get. Uh, and uh, you can approach the distance metric in different ways, but one typical distance metric that you would uh, look into is when uh, you measure the percentage of inputs for which uh, the target model and the substitute model do not agree, right? So the, 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 the predictions are different. So you compute this distance and you want to minimize this distance. So that distance should be the smallest. So for example, you have a hundred samples that you are comparing the two models on and on 99 of them, they agree and on one, they disagree. So 1% is sort of the distance here. Okay. Uh, so we want, we want to keep that distance as low as, uh, as it can get. Okay, so as you can see here, we're trying to approximate the, what we call functional equivalence. Okay, so in the sense of this functional equivalence or in the revised problem statement for model extraction, there are two broad approaches that you can follow. One is what we call the formal or mathematical uh, method where you would do this direct analysis. For example, you can try for simpler models. You can try equation solving or for uh, or you can apply this cryptanalytic um, uh, extraction. So the equation solving is when you have simple models like linear models and you have you know some of the variables, you could solve for the unknowns as you do it in linear equations. Uh, the other approach is in the sense of cryptography where you are given some information about, let's say, some underlying scheme like an encryption scheme and you're given a cipher text and you have some idea of what the encryption scheme is, then you can... Think about approaches like, okay, uh, can I can I recover the key of the encryption, or can I, uh, if I know the key, I, can I also recover the plain text given a cipher text, right? Uh, so that idea is also one uh, attractive approach for extracting fairly, uh, you know, moderately simple models. The other class of approaches is what we call learning based, and this is basically uh, has to do with uh, a, a function approximation. Okay, so the idea here is function approximation. And uh, the way we're gonna do this is you're gonna train a substitute model FS, like I was saying earlier, by querying the target model on a separate data set D prime, which is much smaller than the target model's training set and typically disjoint. And you do uh, the comparison of similarity between uh, the two models uh, on yet another separate data set D prime, uh, D double prime, but Okay, now um, I'll, I'll kind of highlight the first approach where we do equation solving because for some models, this is possible, especially for simpler models. Okay, so if you're looking at a linear model, so suppose you know that the, the prediction API uh, is based on a linear model, okay? So what you would do uh, for a linear model is the following. So you're given uh, a target model, uh, trend on some data set D uh, on, uh, as a linear model, and it accepts an input X of some dimension D and returns a prediction of this form. So a dot product between the 
weight of the model and uh, values of the features of the input plus some bias. Okay. So what you can uh, do is, of course, you're you were given a, a set a data set D prime uh, with let's say n samples are there, uh, and this is a separate data set that's disjoint with D. Uh, and for the sake of just this demonstration, uh, let's assume that B is zero, and this is typically done when you try to solve this kind of problems. So the idea is you want to extract the best approximation of the target model given uh, the bias is zero. So what you would do is you would pick any uh, any data point from this data set D prime. Let's say we picked we picked X i, and you're gonna use X i as uh, you, you're gonna represent X i as a feature set uh, where you just make all the other features zero and enable only one feature. Okay. For example, you can give if this is an image, um, you can basically give a pixel value of one and shut down or switch off all the other pixels to zero and pass this to the model. And you would get, what you would get is because the model now has been modified to by assuming B equals, uh, assuming B equals zero, uh, you would uh, transform this model to Y equals uh, WX. So you're given uh, X uh, and you will, will also get the prediction output. So, uh, and uh, the input is one for every, every uh, for the input is, uh, the input feature has one as a value for the first uh, feature and everything is zero. So that would basically give you W1 as uh, you would recover uh, the first dimension of the weight. And you would do the same thing, except that, you know, you would just shift the value that is enabled to the next entry in the feature vector to recover the corresponding weight dimension, uh, W2, W3, and so on up to WD. So basically by running, uh, by querying the target model on this carefully crafted versions of the input aligned with the, the weight dimension that you wanna extract uh, and the maximum number of queries you have to do here is a D, the, the size of the dimension of the weights of the model. Uh, and you don't even need more than one input. You just have to repurpose the same input uh, and uh, extract uh, the uh, linear model. Okay, so that's sort of the, the idea behind equation solving uh, when you have to, when you have, uh, you know, one unknown in the equation of the, the model. Uh, you can expand this idea into other uh, models, for example, neural networks. So you can zoom in on, let's say, one neuron or one perceptron, and you can do the same thing because in some cases, um, well, not in some cases, in most cases, if you look at one unit of uh, a given neural network, it's a, a linear uh, equation. So it, it's a piecewise uh, linear, right? So um, now let me... Um, reiterate the same problem, but for a neural net. So you're given FB trend on D for input X with dimension D and return this a prediction Y, uh, not as WX plus B, but some activation function applied on uh, the WX plus B uh, output of the linear equation. And the G here is uh, uh, some, some activation function, for example, sigmoid and so on. And there are only a handful uh, of activation functions uh, that are effective. So it's not really hard to kind of guess what activation functions are used. You can even try, uh, you know, a bunch of the popular ones. Okay, so for this, for this illustration, I'll assume a zero hidden layer, but you can incrementally explore this by putting in one hidden layer uh, and then playing with the units or the number of nodes in each layer, right? So we'll have the same setup where we have D prime as the separate data set. And again, I will assume B equals zero just for the sake of this illustration. And our goal is the same. We wanna extract the best approximation of the model. Okay. Now, doing the equation solving, so you will pick any XI and you will do the same approach, which means you switch on the first feature and make everything else zero and you pass it to the, the model and the model would give you some result. But you also know, um, you can also guess, or you 
sometimes no. The the actual activation function that is used, for example, for sigmoid, the function uh, is uh, if you have some z, uh, the sigmoid of z is one over one plus e the power of minus z, right? So uh, you can plug in that equation and basically compute uh, the first dimension of the weight uh, as, for instance, the ln of one over the prediction minus one. The same way you could do that for the next dimensions and eventually discover uh, all the dimensions of the weight up to the last dimension here. So it is the same idea of the previous slide for um, a purely uh, linear equation, but now a linear equation, uh, non-linearized using an activation function because the goal of the activation function is to make it non-linear, right? So uh, you can also basically unwrap the uh, activation function and try to discover uh, the, the individual weight dimensions of the model uh, and extract the models this way, okay? So this idea could be extrapolated for, you know, a more complex neural networks because uh, what, what I showed you here is just one node or one perceptron, but um, uh, you can think about this depending on how many unknowns you have in a given layer and the number of, uh, units or nodes in a given way. Okay, um, so that is a highlight of how model extraction could be done uh, using the equation solving approach. Uh, over the years, since 2016, there are a lot of considerations as to uh, how to extract uh, models. For example, some approaches took advantage of how fine-grained the output of the model is like is it only a label or some prediction uh, probability scores, or is the model, um, is the, the substitute model architecturally similar to the target model? Uh, do we have similarities between the features of the target and the substitute? Um, can we take advantage of this transferability aspect that we saw in uh, adversarial examples? And the extraction strategies range from equation solving, just like we saw it, optimization, which is learning-based approaches, some generative techniques like using uh, generative adversarial networks, or even can, uh, re reinforcement learning has been used as um, a framing for model extraction attacks. Okay, so there is a whole range of methods that have been tried for uh, effective model extraction attacks. Okay, um, so since the most widely used strategy is learning-based approaches, uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk about a little more about an, uh, an actual extraction approach that we proposed uh, in 2020 from our lab. Uh, this has to do with extracting a black box malware classifier. And the threat model that we consider is uh, the following. So we are assuming that the adversary has uh, minimal access to uh, a separate data set five to 10% of the original training uh, data set. And this data set is just joined with the training set of the target model. The fidelity of the output that we're, uh, we have is the output is just a zero or one because this is a malware classifier. So zero for benign, one for malware and nothing more. So for example, we don't have probability uh, distribution for labels. And the feature representations we have uh, are different. So the target model was trained on byte sequences of uh, Windows executable, while the substitute model, as you will see, was trained on images. Uh, and the goal here is, can we extract an equivalent model, functional equivalent model, even in the face of this uh, different representations of features? And the other thing is the target models uh, training set and the substitute training uh, set are destroyed. So the goal here is uh, to, to see how close we can get to the target model through the training of a substitute model under this uh, challenging threat model. Because before this, there were uh, the, the papers that I point to here, they have looked at a, a threat model where the adversary has more luxury in terms of information, like similar features, similar model architecture, et cetera. Uh, and you know more about the predictions like probability distribution, distributions. But in our case here, we are trying to demonstrate whether it is possible to extract something that is functionally equivalent to the target model 
uh, in the face of all these constraints, because in, in this case, the adversary has constraints all around in terms of the number of samples that are accessible, the output is not that fine grained, the feature representations are different and the data sets are disjoint. Okay, so here is an overview of the approach. So what we're trying to do is we assume that we have uh, a black box model that was trained on data set D right here, uh, and that is not accessible to the, the adversary, of course, and the, the model is ex exposed as a prediction API. Uh, so here is what we have for what we call approximator uh, set labeling. So the adversary has uh, D prime uh, for training the substitute model or to approximate the substitute model. So the first thing the adversary does is just labeling this. The labeling, as you know, you just uh, send the individual inputs in D prime, get the predictions back, and you would use that as a ground truth for training. Once you have that, we have what we call representation mapping because the uh, data set that we are using is very small to train a substitute model. So we have to leverage uh, image classification models by mapping the byte sequences of the samples in D prime to uh, image representations. And I'll tell you more about that. And at the end, uh, well, before the end, the end is comparison. Uh, we do the, the central part of the uh, approach is this uh, progressive approximation where we progressively train uh, the substitute model on the data set we have and keep watching its accuracy until, for example, it becomes close enough to the target model. And finally, we do the comparison, the similarity comparison or the functional equivalence comparison. Uh, and for that, we use a separate data set from D and D prime uh, and that is D double prime. So yet another, um, you know, disjoint data set. Okay, so the notations we have down here are pretty much uh, consistent with what I have been saying so far. So D is the training set for the target model. D prime is a training set for the substitute or approximation model. And D double prime is the comparison data set. The size of D prime is much smaller than the size of D. The three data sets are disjoint and the, the representation of features for the target model is in byte sequences, while the subset model, as you will see, is in pixels because we're leveraging image classification uh, for extracting the model. So uh, one part of the process is this thing called representation mapping. So what do we do? So in this case, to make it up for the scarcity of data and also the fact that, you know, we cannot really steal a well-trained uh, black box malware classification model that might rely on millions of samples. What we do is we take the byte representation of Windows executables, and we do this bytes to pixels mapping, and we get basically a byte representation, uh, sorry, a pixel representation of uh, a Windows binary. So what happens is, here is the key idea is, the values that are close to each other in the byte space they are also placed close to each other in the pixel space. So when you generate an image of this nature from a binary executable, you would uh, follow that mapping to make sure that you know, the image also reflects this. Uh, so the, there are a bunch of mapping methods that you can do for given a byte sequence of a binary uh, to get the image representation. One is uh, based on the famous uh, Shannon entropy or uh, the entropy method which is basically computing this uh, entropy value, 0 to 255, which also works well or matches the, uh, the values range for pixel representations. Uh, the other approach is the color Hilbert approach, which uh, is basically representing a byte value into pixel intensity values. And this is also pretty similar. And it goes with our setup of you know, leveraging um, image classification models. So the benefit here is, as you might notice, there is no need for manual feature engineering as we do it in traditional machine learning for malware classification. We take advantage of this uh, pixel representation um, and you can trade more advanced uh, models like convolutional neural networks. 
And as I said, we can leverage pre-trained models uh, through transferability. Uh, and that's basically the key insight of this work. So you can start with a very small data set, uh, label that with the target model, transform this inputs to images, and then use these images uh, as the extra uh, fine tuning a stage for uh, training on an existing model and take advantage of uh, transferability in machine learning. So before I talk about that part, here is an example of how the representation looks like for benign Windows executables and malicious Windows executables. So the entropy representation is this part and the color Hilbert representation is this. For the malicious Windows executable, the, here is the entropy representation and uh, this one is the color Hilbert representation. So you would see you know, uh, differences in the way the, the, the two classes of samples are uh, narrated through this uh, pixel representation. Okay, so the the part of the approach that does the progressive training of substitute model here is a sketch of the algorithm that uh, you 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 could refer to this in the paper. Uh, so basically, what we have is we have two thresholds: threshold for the accuracy uh, of uh, the model that we're training, the substitute model, and threshold for the similarity between the substitute model and the target model. And we're gonna run this over the number of batches and this is gonna be determined by how much data we have, of course. So assuming uh, we're running it on, let's say a small portion of the data, let's say 10% of the target model's training set, we're gonna compute the accuracy of the substitute model uh, and get it for a batch. And we compare the model that we have trained up to that point against uh, the target model's accuracy. And if the accuracy of uh, the substitute model is greater than our threshold and the similarity between the two is also fulfilling our similarity threshold, then we stop the approximation or we stop the, tra the progressive training. And we will say, okay, we have a model that is good enough in terms of functional equivalence with the, the target model. And the functional equivalence comparison part is pretty straightforward. So for some number of uh, samples for comparison, let's say n number of samples, uh, what you're gonna do is you will just loop through the samples and send the sample, the individual samples to each of the models. So the substitute and the target model. And if they match, you keep counting the matches. And then at the end, you will compute a percentage of comparison, uh, a percentage of uh, similarity which basically tells you how close the two models are, functionally speaking, because if they are predicting the same way for the most part, they must be close in terms of what they are doing or their decision boundary. So that is basically what uh, the um, functional equivalence comparison is. Uh, and this is one of the common ways to do it. Okay, so the, the part that I didn't tell you much about is how do we leverage transferability for um, extracting malware classifiers using image uh, representation of the executables in Windows. So here is how it goes. So uh, from our approximation set G prime, we're gonna do representation mapping as I showed you earlier, and you will end up with images of uh, the image equivalent representations of the, of the Windows malware executables. Uh, so these are all images. Now, once I have images, what I can do is you can leverage a pre-trained uh, image classification model. At the time, this was in 2020, at the time uh, the Inception V3 model from Google was sort of the state of the art for transferability evaluation. So we grabbed that model. And what we did is we take the samples and use uh, this image representations of the Windows executables to just train the last layer of the Inception V3 model. Uh, of course, we have to do some pre-processing to match the images over here to the images that are acceptable to uh, the pre-trained model, which was not much. And we produced the substitute model, uh, our FS, and that is what we call our approximated model uh, with respect to the target model. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is I'll just briefly tell you how effective this extraction was, where we started with a small amount of data like five to ten percent of the training set, and uh, ended up with uh, um, a model that is close enough to the target model. 
So we did this evaluation on two data sets. So we have this uh, uh, Malcolm data set uh, model that was uh, trained on byte representations of Windows executables. And we also have this Ember data set that uh, uh, is based on uh, um, static features of uh, Windows executables. Uh, so for the training set of the target model, we had about 20,000 each for benign and malware. For training set of the substitute model, 8,000 each. And for the similarity comparison, we had a smaller uh, data set for the benign, but we had a lot of uh, malware samples. And this is generally true. You, you find a lot of uh, malware samples, but not much uh, data points for benign inputs because most of the benign executables are copyrighted. So in that sense, that is why the imbalance is here, but uh, it doesn't really affect because this is the similarity comparison set. Okay, um, and on the Ember data set, we have you know, a larger data set, like we used um, uh, 400K for the training set for each uh, label and for the, tra for, for the training set of the, the target model. For the substitute training set, we use 75K each. And for the similarity comparison, we use 25K each. And all of these data sets are disjoint as, as per our threat model that I described earlier. So now I'll tell you what happened uh, when we evaluated this. So this is the result of the progressive uh, extraction approach where we started with a small amount, let's say 4K, which is 10% of uh, the original training set for D because that's 40K as I showed you here. So that's 40K, right? So we started with a very small amount and we kept on increasing these values by doing, because now that we have image representations, we can leverage techniques in image uh, in the image domain like data augmentation to get you know, more copies of the, the same image. So we, we leveraged those like rotation and so on. Uh, so that's how we ended up with, let's say up to 60K uh, images of uh, the, the malware samples. Uh, so as you can see on the x-axis is this progressive uh, uh, incre increment of the input size or the, the, the training size starting with 4K. And the y-axis is the validation accuracy of the substitute model that we're training. So when the substitute model uh, is Malcolm byte sequence, this is sort of the benchmark. So we use the original uh, byte sequence representation to see what where it falls. So as you can see, the accuracy is over around 80%. And then the two are the ones that we extracted. So our substitute models are this two. The first one is color Hilbert, just based on the representation of the mapping uh, use color, using color Hilbert. And the second one is the entropy. So they are pretty much comparable. So the blue line and the green line are the substitute models that we extracted. So uh, of course, uh, this is just the progressive uh, approximation and their validation accuracy, but that may not tell you how good these substitute models are until you do this comparison, similarity comparison between the substitute models and the target model. So you looked at uh, the, the custom Malcolm is our target model uh, with bytes representations. And here is our color Hilbert representation of the substitute model and the entropy representation. The test accuracy is about 99.1%. And the similarity is, as you can see, um, uh, close to 88% for the entropy representation of the model that we extracted. So the entropy representation uh, shows the highest agreement between the target and the substitute model. Okay, close to 90%. So for a threat model that we're considering where the adversary is constrained in many ways, this is uh, this is a very promising direction for extraction because in the past papers or research uh, researchers have shown uh, up to 100% accuracy for extraction, but assuming that they have leverage on many things. But this one is almost, um, you know, almost nothing as far as uh, the, the advantage of the adversary groups. The same feature representation uh, where we use the byte sequence of the target model it ended up with uh, about 80% similarity, so which was very interesting because in the past, people have shown uh, when feature representations are similar, the model extraction accuracy increases or the, the functional equivalence between the models is larger, but in our case, it's not. So that, that's one of the, you know, the things that we observed. So that was on uh, the Malconf model, but 
We also looked at a more relaxed uh, threat model where the adversary knows the features from public knowledge. For example, the Ember data set is there, so the, the features are publicly available. So our benchmark model is the model that comes with the data set called the light GPM model, uh, which is a variation of a you know gradient boosted decision tree model. Uh, uh, and we extract three models. So uh, hey, nearest neighbors, random first, and decision tree are the three models that we extracted. And as you can see, the, the progressive uh, approximation or extraction accuracy is pretty close. And the comparison is uh, as follows. So if you look at the last column here, so the, the similarity between the target and the uh, the extracted or the subset model is, you know, uh, close to ninety percent, as is as was the case with the other uh, data set, and of course with the 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 same kind of model, uh, it is uh, ninety seven percent. Not not a surprise at all. But when you compare the three models that we extracted, the KNN model agrees with the black box model. Uh, almost the same as the inception V3 model. So this is also another observation we had as to you know the, the precision of the extraction in terms of functional equivalence, uh, given the constraint we have on the adversary here. But for this data set, the uh, constraint is relaxed a little bit uh, in, in, such a case, in such a way that the adversary knows a little bit about the feature representations. Okay, um, so that is sort of uh, a concrete example of how we approached model extraction for a very constrained adversary in in malware detection or extracting uh, malware mo detection model. Uh, so one important aspect of model extraction attacks is this connection with uh, other attacks that we've talked about, especially adversarial examples and uh, membership inference. So here is how uh, model extraction could be serving as a stepping stone for um, uh, for adversarial examples. So the, the goal here is you're gonna fool a target model trained on some data set with adversarial examples under the following constraints. So the adversary is constrained because they only have Oracle access to the target model and they know nothing about the details of the model and data set. So effectively a black box threat model. And as in any model extraction attacker, they do have access to some uh, data set D prime, which comes from the same distribution as the target models training set. Now, the first thing the adversary would do is they would query the target model on this inputs and get you know, the predictions. And they would have this labeled prediction, uh, labels data set, and they will use this labeled data set to train uh, uh, the model, uh, the substitute model, and they would get let's say a model that is functionally close to the uh, target model by doing that metric of comparing, comparing you know, on how many predictions the two models agree. Let's say your threshold is 99%. And finally, what the adversary would do is, okay, now that we have an approximate copy of the target model, even though I have black box access to the model, I have white box access to the substitute model. So you, you can use the, the subset model as a white box proxy to craft white box adversarial examples like FGSM, PGD, et cetera, to basically see whether this attacks work against uh, this white box model, substitute model or not. And if the attacks work on the substitute model, chances are they would work on the target model as well, simply because we know, uh, not, not only because they are functionally equivalent, but we know for a fact that this is possible because of transferability. Okay, we have seen this in adversarial examples case. So the the what is happening here is that the substitute model is essentially serving as a white box proxy to attack the target model, uh, and this has been shown in the past. Here is uh, an example of a paper that showed uh, this in back in 2016, 17, where they attacked you know real machine learning as a service providers and uh, uh, they used a variety of models like deep learning models and um, you know simpler models like logistic regression uh, and in some cases they didn't even know what model was behind the prediction api 
uh, and the number of queries they used is not that much. For example, in this case, it's 6,400. And in other cases, in simpler models, it was even much smaller, like 800 uh, and so on. Uh, it was not more than, let's say, 2,000 queries in, in the results shown here. And what you see here in the last column here is the adversarial examples that are misclassified, uh, by, which means by the uh, misclassified by the substitute model, which were transferable to the black box model as well. So basically, once they made sure that the adversarial examples fool the substitute model, they also tried them against the uh, machine learning as service prediction API. And this is the number of matches or the adversarial examples that worked on both models, right? So you could see uh, from 84% to 97%. And interestingly, uh, the highest uh, similarity is uh, or transferability is on the model for which you know the the attackers they didn't know what was the behind the prediction API. Okay, so that's a very interesting connection between um, adversarial examples and model extraction, where model extraction serves as a stepping stone. The other um, link with uh, uh, of uh, model extraction with other attacks is where model extraction could serve as a proxy for privacy motivated attacks. So the setup is similar, uh, except that in this case, uh, the goal of the adversary is to use this model, uh, uh, to use the substitute model to do privacy motivated attacks. So they will, uh, the adversary would query the model as was the case for the previous and will get a labeled dataset and train the substitute model uh, once the substitute model is good enough, what they can do is they craft, instead of adversarial examples, they craft membership inference attacks, uh, for example, using the shadow model uh, attack that we have discussed in the previous lecture. And they would end up with a situation where the if the attack succeeds on the substitute model, it will most likely succeed on the target model as well, simply because the two models are trained on data sets that come from the same data distribution. So what is happening here is the uh, substitute model is now serving as a copy of, let's say, the distilled version of the private data, right? So any any attack that works on this substitute model is likely to work on the original uh, model or the original data set, right? So this will have um, some implications on privacy uh, sensitive data or models, uh, models trained on privacy sensitive data. Okay, so that was on the connection between uh, model extraction and uh, other attacks like adversarial examples and uh, membership inference. And lastly, we will talk about a little bit about defense against model extraction. But as I said at the beginning, among the attacks that we know against machine learning models, uh, in my opinion, the hardest to defend is uh, model extraction. But regardless of how hard this is, there are some uh, preventive and uh, uh, reactive measures that uh, model deployers or machine learning as service providers can, can take. So there are two broad categories of um, countermeasures against uh, model extraction. One is what we call the proactive uh, approach where you aim for preventing the attack. The other is the reactive approach where you would be detecting. So on the proactive front, you would be taking this preemptive measures to avoid or at least significantly limit the accuracy of the extraction or basically discourage the adversary. So for instance, you can proactively limit the information gained by the adversary. On the other hand, when you do the reactive approach, uh, you would assume that you would be attacked anyway, and you would have either on the fly detection of the extraction attempts and do something about it. For example, you block the adversary, or you could also do this after the fact detection of the a model that has already been stolen. So on the um, proactive front, or when you use attack prevention based countermeasures, here are some of the countermeasures that would, would work in practice. And some of these techniques are actually used in practice for uh, with uh, machine learning as a service providers. One of them is query budget limits. So this helps a lot. Uh, at least in discouraging the adversary or forcing the adversary to look for other countermeasures or uh, workarounds. So you could set the limit uh, per user per, per IP address. 
Uh, so basically setting the quota here, or um, yes, this approach could be bypassed by, you know, using some techniques like IP spoofing or uh, timing of the, the queries and, and so on, or conspiring with other users in other places uh, and so on. Uh, with all those, you know, downsides, this, if done well, this is an effective approach. The other is uh, limiting how much verbose the output of the predictions or the, the prediction API is going to be. For example, uh, you could round the uh, confidence scores. If you're producing confidence scores as part of the, the prediction, you can limit these confidence scores by, let's say, one, two, three, four significant digits. Uh, and uh, this, of course, doesn't change the distribution of the probability scores, but it might end up uh, limiting the accuracy of the extracted model. And this has been shown uh, as one possible countermeasure, especially against uh, linear models. Or you could also do this perturbation of uh, confidence values. And again, when you do this, you don't wanna mess with, let's say the, the predicted label or the overall distribution or the probability distribution. Uh, and this could still can uh, allow the adversary to do approximation, but this is one measure that you can combine with other measures, measures like query budget limit and so on. Another approach that is seems to be pervasively um, effective uh, to to different degrees, you know, not not the same degree as let's say, for instance, limiting membership inference is uh, differential privacy, where you add noise to the model weights while making sure that the accuracy of the model is not hurt that much. But as we know, um, adversarial uh, sorry, uh, differential privacy. Uh, is um, has implications. It, does, it doesn't come uh, for free. It, it has implications on the target model's uh, benign accuracy. Okay. Um, the other side of the defense or countermeasure is uh, attack detection or this reactive approach, right? So this one broadly falls into two groups. So one is the general idea of anomaly detection or some spotting some outliers. And this is through query pattern uh, or signature analysis, for example, identifying what is unusual uh, with respect to benign queries. So you have to keep watching what uh, these pattern of queries are and try to say, oh, this looks like a very uh, aggressive sequence of queries or a you know population of queries. Therefore, this might be motivated by a model extraction attacker. Uh, this works. Um, at times, but it may not be a lasting solution uh, because the adversaries can game the system. The other is watermarking, where you would be embedding some unique identifiers or watermarks in the model uh, uh, or in its predictions to basically trace the origin of the extracted models. This is useful when you are you're trying to detect whether your model has been uh, stolen or not. For example, if there is a a whole bunch of models uh, in some public repository, and you suspect that one of those models or more, one or more of those models are uh, your model, you can basically grab those models and check whether the models contain the watermark. And you could be, um, you could be, you know, having a case against the, whoever is publishing that model. But the challenge with watermarking is the watermark could be removed by retraining uh, or when fine tuning the model. Uh, uh, this the stolen model, right? Um, so it depends on how resilient your watermarks are against uh, retraining. Okay, so that's pretty much um, the the points that I wanted to cover in this lecture. But to kind of summarize what we've talked about here, so we started with uh, the motivation of why machine learning as a service is an interesting business model and uh, the focus on you know serving predictions uh, while keeping the models and the data confidential and that motivates a model extraction adversary where uh, because of training these models is expensive and stealing is one of the options explored by adversaries and we should care about model extraction because you know what what went into the uh, the training of the model could be data that is of intellectual property or privacy sensitive data or other sensitive data that is, uh, if exposed through the model or uh, through predictions could endanger um, either uh, companies' profits or uh, individuals or even nations when the model 
is trained on like uh, security sensitive data. And we've looked at the threat models uh, where we have a black box API uh, access. Um, uh, we have access to auxiliary data where adversaries can locally train a service model and they might be um, aiming for high accuracy or high fidelity or uh, a model that is undetectable by the prediction API. Uh, and for attacks, we broadly looked at two classes, equation solving and learning based. And the learning based is a widely used uh, attacks, uh, attack strategies. And uh, we walked, uh, we went through, you know, an attack strategy that we have done uh, in our lab. Uh, and we also looked at the connection to other uh, attacks, uh, specifically how model extraction could be used as a stepping stone for mounting white box uh, adversarial example attacks and also membership inference. And uh, on the defense front, we talked about these two broad classes of approaches, uh, preventive and uh, detection-based approaches. But uh, underscoring that you know, mo defending model extraction uh, is hard, but there are some, uh, uh, some approaches that we've uh, discussed here that could be useful, at least in discouraging the adversary or raising the bar against uh, the adversary. Okay, so that uh, uh, we, we're done for the lecture today on uh, model extraction and I hope to see you for the next one.